you're, if you're not muting, please mute. Um, my name is Carl Rhodes. I'm chair of the Judiciary Committee, and this Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agenda, the 9.30 a.m. JDC agenda. Um, since this is the first hearing of the new session, I would like to just go ahead and allow, uh, or please, if you'd like to, members of the committee, introduce yourselves. And we'll start with the newest member, uh, Senator Casio. Good morning. My name is uh, Laura Ocasio, and I'm the current senator for Senate District 1, Hilo. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, why don't we go with the next new member, Chris Lee. He's, Hi, uh, okay. he's, coming in. he's coming in right now. Okay. Uh, why don't I switch to, uh, for the moment, let's go to uh, Senator Kim. Aloha. Good morning. Senator Donna Mercado Kim from the 15th Senatorial District. And why don't we go, uh, Senator Lee, we're just doing quick introductions since it's the first hearing of the, uh, of the session. Hi, everyone. Uh, Chris Lee, represent the Windward side of Oahu in the 25th District. Thank you. I, um, Vice Chair Senator Keo Kololi, I don't see yet. Uh, Senator Favela, would you like to say a couple words? Uh, aloha, uh, Senator Kurt Favela, District 19, Eva Beach, Ocean Point part of Eva Villages and Iroquois Point. And I, since I took everybody out of order, I think I skipped over Senator Gabbard. Go ahead. Aloha and good morning. Senator Gabbard representing District 20. Most beautiful Senate district in the state, I might say. Aloha. I don't know about that. <laughs> Objection. 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 Oh, well noted. Uh, the, this meeting, including the audio and video of remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Thursday, February 4 at 9 a.m. And a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website, and that will be uh, all on, on, um, all on Zoom as well. For the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. Don't forget there's a two minute uh, time limit per, testi per, uh, per testifier as there has always been since I've been chair of this committee. Um, if there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you that the committee has already received your written testimony. Uh, I'll be list, reading a list of people who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closing closed captioning doesn't act, accurately describe the names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website, www.capitalwithno.hawaii.gov, and you'll find a link to testimony on the status page for the measure. Members, please wait to ask your questions of the testifiers until we have gone through all the testifiers for the measure per usual. Okay, we're starting out today with SB 200. Uh, this clarifies that candidates or other committee representatives as specified who make contributions over a certain amount prior to an election are required to file, to file a late contribution report only if the candidate is on the ballot in that election. On SB 200, first we have Barry Cam for the Campaign Spending Commission. Let's see, now I, does I, IT, do you turn him on or, okay. There we go. Hi Chair, Please members proceed. of the committee, uh, I stand on my written testimony in support. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause Hawaii. Good morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Um, we stand in our testimony in opposition. Uh, we think more disclosure is always better. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all the written testimony we have on SB 200. Members, any questions for the two testifiers we have today? Um, let's see if I have anything here, just a second. So I, for, for Gary Cam, if you can come back up. So just so I'm 
sure I understand the current situation. Does the, the statute being amended apply to persons who are not on the ballot for the general election? I mean, currently, are they, if you're not on the ballot for the general election, you're still required to file the late um, campaign uh, contribution report, even if, even if you're not on the ballot, is that correct? Yeah, because the late contribution report requirement is in a separate uh, section of the law. So the 11-334 for the uh, preliminary final supplemental reports, that one is the one that says that if you're on the ballot, then you have to follow those reports. If you're not, then you just follow the supplemental reports. So this late contribution report statute is separate from that one, and it doesn't say anything about being on the ballot or not. So, uh, but it just, it, it, it makes sense though. If you're not on the ballot, then you you just follow the next report that's applicable to you. Okay, okay. Uh, for Sandy Ma, Common Cause. So, what value do you see of having the keeping this uh, this reporting requirement when the so if you have won the general, even in a house race, it's going to be two years before you're on the ballot again, and the other. Um, the other reporting requirements are still intact. So the, that's at least my understanding of the purpose of having the late uh, spending report was so that if someone dumped a bunch of money on a late, late in a race, then you'd get to be able to see who it was. But in this case, there's no race, it's already over. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing, maybe tell me what you're seeing. Why do you think we should keep it? Thank you, sorry, I was just making sure my mute I'm not on you. Um, I wasn't clear of all the scenarios for the reporting and we're really leery of removing any reporting requirements. And so we're more concerned about removing a reporting requirement in case there is a report that we're missing. And so uh, we're always erring on the side of caution to require more reporting than less reporting. Okay, all right, understood. Okay, members, any other questions on this one? Seeing none, let's go ahead and thank you very much, both, both the testifiers. Let's go ahead and move on to SB 294. This restricts civil asset forfeiture to cases involving the commission of a felony offense where the property owner has been convicted of an underlying uh, felony, directs any forfeiture proceeds to the general fund First on this one, we have uh, Gary Senega for the Attorney General. I think I saw him here. Yes, go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Rhodes, Vice Chair Keoho Kalole, and members of the committee. <clears throat> um, my name is Gary Senega. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Department of Attorney General, mainly just to provide comments and, and echo and, and tell you the concerns the AGs have on the bill. But we would like to start off by saying that uh, the 2018 audit, which you know raised some problems uh, that was discovered in the program and they, the auditor offered recommendations for improvement. Uh, we're pleased to report that uh, six of the seven recommendations by the auditor have been implemented by our office. And we partially Im implemented the eighth, the seventh. So seven recommendations. We've successfully carried out what the auditors requested we, we do to make to improve the program. And these seven include, of course, promulgation of the rules, um, uh, of, uh, provide more guidance for participants in the program, law enforcement, as well as interested parties or persons or owners of the property, clarity, clarity, transparency, and accountability. The one uh, recommendation that fell short of for, for implementation is the auditor's recommendation that 20% of the forfeiture funds be used for drug education, prevention, and rehabilitation. The reason why that wasn't fully implemented was Essentially, there is a question as to the legality of that, of having monies distributed for that purpose. Uh, the auditor found that requirement in the, the bills, the 
the origination of the bill's um, purpose, but it was not put into the section of the actual statute in section 712A-16, which lays out how the department is to distribute the funds. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is James Tabe, uh, Office of the Public Defender. That was fast. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Rhodes. Good morning, Vice Chair Keoho Kalole and, uh, and the committee members. Uh, first off, I just want to apologize to Vice Chair for misspelling his name in my written testimony. That won't happen again. Um, but basically we do, um, I just want to state that there is a problem with the asset forfeiture laws, not only in Hawaii, but across this country here. I am sure that the, the law uh, the law was first passed with good intentions, but obviously um, this committee and the bill points out many flaws um, in, this, in the process here. And I do urge um, all of you, if you haven't already, to um, view um, John Oliver's uh, rant. We have a link in our testimony. I think he uh, explains or he basically, he sums up the problems of the asset forfeiture laws that we have here in Hawaii. Um, thank you. OK. You do have one more minute if you want it. No, I'm, I'm fine. OK, great. <laughs> this thank long. You. Next up is uh, Jason Radula for, for the Department of uh, Land and Natural Resources. Morning. Please proceed. Good morning, Chair and members. Jason Radula for DLNR. We will stand on our written testimony respectfully opposing this measure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Max Otani, Director, Department of Public Safety, his designee. Hi, uh, Senator Rhodes. Uh, Max Otani is not present in the Zoom not call. Not present. Okay, he's in, uh, in opposition. Uh, next, we have Trisha Nakamatsu for Prosecuting Attorney, Sitting County of Honolulu. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Hi. Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu, on behalf of the Department of the Prosecuting Attorney, uh, City and County of Honolulu. Uh, you have our written testimony. We are uh, strongly opposed to this bill. The Civil Asset Forfeiture Program was specifically designed to run parallel to the criminal system, much like our any other aspect of our civil courts is intended to run parallel uh, or completely separate from our criminal justice system. That's why they have two separate standards. For example, you could have a drunk driver who uh, administrative, has an administrative hearing, loses their license, then has a civil hearing, perhaps where they're sued by the family if they, they, they hit somebody. Then they could have a criminal justice, a criminal hearing where they go to trial for the drunk driving itself. All of those would stem from the exact same act, the same wrongful act, but they have different repercussions and different standards. And that's just the way every aspect of our of our legal system is set up. So I think this bill, or we, we believe that this bill is ignoring the fact that um, it is not just asset forfeiture that has civil and criminal, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, different avenues, but also uh, different repercussions for a single act. And civil typically deals with um, money, property, things like that, land use commission, liquor commission, DCCA hearings, those are all preponderance of the evidence and they're all civil hearings. Criminal justice system is beyond a reasonable doubt because that deals with somebody's liberty, their freedom. You can lock them up and put them in jail, literally, and not let them out, whether they want to or not. So that is why beyond a reasonable doubt is the criminal justice standard, and that is why there is a separate standard for civil. Um, we would just emphasize to the court, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, we just emphasize to the committee that there are good reasons for these different standards, and if you feel that there's uh, maybe there's the accountability, the transparency. Those are things that the AG has already met the standards set by or the recommendations of the auditor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Tracy Ryan in support. John Bickle. I'm sorry, Tracy Ryan for Libertarian Party in support. John Bickle, Americans for Democratic Action in support. Will Carone, uh, Young Progressives Demanding Action also in support. Next, we have Mandy Fernandez, Policy Director for the ACLU of Hawaii, who I believe is here. Yes, go ahead. Morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Mandy Fernandez on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union of Hawaii. We strongly support this measure as we have in previous years. 
Uh, civil asset forfeiture, as you know, is a civil action brought against a piece of property on the premise that that property is guilty of a crime. It became popular as part of the failed war on drugs, um, not just in Hawaii, but around the country. The purpose of civil asset forfeiture is supposed to be to disable criminal operations, but instead it's often used as a way just to pad police and prosecutors' budgets with little oversight or accountability, and it's no different here in Hawaii. So Hawaii civil asset forfeiture, as we've heard, is one of the worst in the nation. We have a low burden of proof. Hardly anyone gets to have their day in court before their property is forfeited or sold off by the state. And if they do go to court, it is at their own expense. We do not require that the crime is even tied to the property owner. There was a, um, a case that got a lot of media attention a couple of years ago uh, in which a a son borrowed his mom's car and ended up being accused of a crime later and the car was forfeited and she lost the car even though um, he was not actually convicted of that crime. And she obviously didn't know that uh, that any crime would have occurred even if it did. So she lost her car and her mode of transportation. I think it had serious career ramifications for her as well and lost her livelihood. So these things have very serious consequences for the victims of civil asset forfeiture and innocent property owners. Uh, and this is not a unique case. In fact, a 2018 report by the state auditor found that in over a quarter of all forfeiture cases, they were done where there were no corresponding criminal charges. So not only is somebody not even being convicted of a crime related to this piece of property, but there's never even charges brought against anyone. So if we're talking about running parallel to the criminal legal system, that's not even parallel because the criminal proceedings were not even, uh, not even initiated. This is often called policing for profit because law enforcement here and in other places have strong incentive to seize valuable property that is only tenuously okay. connected. Thank you with very much. Uh, next is um, Michael Galoyer Jr., uh, LGBT Caucus of Democratic Party of Hawaii in support. Kate, Kat Brady, Test, uh, Community Alliance on Prisons in support. Sandy Ma, Common Cause Hawaii in support. Julian Thomas Pascale, in support, Kathy Lee in support, Alani Bakal in support, Ryan Santana in support, Jacqueline Esser in support, Glenn Nagao in support, Dylan Ramos in support, Carrie Ann Shirota in support, Fina Bonoan in support, Diana Bethel in support, Shannon Rudolph in support, Barbara Polk in support, uh, Tania Brookfield in support, and I believe she's here. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I had to unmute. No um, I totally agree with everything that um, Mandy said. And I just wanted to add one additional thing that I'd like to see civil forfeiture uh, eliminated completely and replaced with criminal forfeiture. That'd be the only change. Um, so yes, I appreciate you guys for listening to my testimony and that's all keeping it short. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Christine Weger, <clears throat> excuse me, in support. Joseph Brown III in support. Philip Johnson, major for Honolulu Police Department in opposition. Carla Allison in support. Joe Kent, executive vice president for Grassroot Institute with comments. Mary McHenry in support. Paul Ferreira, police chief for County of Hawaii in opposition. Victor Ramos also testifying for my police department in opposition. That is all the testimony we have on SB 294. Members, any questions? Uh, Chair, um, just one oh, quick Senator, one for the- Senator Lee, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, for the AG, um, just going through your testimony, obviously this is not the first year that this bill has come up. We've, we've passed it out of the legislature before. Um, one of the things that seems to have come to light since then, doing the due diligence, looking into where the funding is going that is collected from these sorts of cases um, is obviously to the prosecutors and, and law enforcement and AG's office, et cetera, um, that those were actually used for some sorts of training, which also included trips to various places, um, obviously pre-COVID, but trips nonetheless. And I guess I was wondering, does it not strike you as a conflict of interest that property seized at the determination of the AGs and law enforcement can be used for those sorts of purposes that benefit its own staff. Hello. Well, regarding that specific example you've given about trips to Vegas, I know we talked about it last year, here we go again. 
uh, once the money is dispersed by the department to the various law enforcement agency, the police department, prosecutor, uh, it, it will be up to them how they spend it. And they do probably, I, I hope they have a, a, a ledger or some kind of record keeping of how they spend, spend it. There is a discretionary funds that the AG does control, take control over, um, has control over, and it's uh, on a case by case recourse by the various law enforcement agencies. And I can speak to that about conflict of interest uh, for them to seize property and then use it for such things. Well, I, I don't know what to say that you see, you view that expenditure of going to Vegas for a conflict as being over the top, but I'll let the counties address that if they, if they care to. But regarding expenditures this past 2019 to 2020 uh, fiscal year, there wasn't a whole lot recovered in the forfeiture fund for distribution, but I can tell you as far as what we reported in, in our annual report, uh, $5,800 went to training and the, the note that I have about that expenditure was for block operation operators training. So this is for one of the departments uh, law enforcement on, on, on the front lines who it was spent for. Um, and that was about it for this past fiscal year. But the year prior, in 20, 2018 to 2019, uh, there's a little bit more money in the discretionary fund. And 5000 went for a National Association for Justice Information Systems Conference and ATF training for forensic chemists. That was about $5,000. And there was $10,000 uh, approved for bulletproof vests and, and other police equipment. Um, so that's all I have to say in response. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you in the interest of time, I'll uh, kick it off to anybody else. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Members, any other questions? I do have a question. Sen Senator Kim. Okay. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I know that the forfeiture law is there to deter people and be a deterrence uh, for crime, but shouldn't it be sort of like the parking tickets where the funds don't go directly to, to the agencies, but perhaps to the general fund and then disperse later so that there is no intent to give out tickets so that the police department can benefit from the money directly? Putting it that way, it does make sense, Senator Kim. Uh, earlier, earlier, the de department did resist or oppose the bill because there was very little uh, guidance or specific uh, sections that made sure the department was paid for doing the work needed to carry out the asset, asset forfeiture program. But in the revised these bills that are now uh, on the table at the legislature this year, there is specific language. Language. So, as far as uh, monies going to the department, we're okay. As far as the remaining funds, general fund versus law enforcement, uh, I can only say that the department, uh, you know, the law enforcement agencies view this as extra funds to do the extra things that they need to effectively fight crime. I don't know if any of the law enforcement uh, representatives at this hearing now can give specifics, but uh, I am relying or um, assuming that that's, that's, what it's be, that's what it's being used for. But couldn't that be said also for other kinds of uh, fines, like tickets that police, you know, want to effectively fight crime or fight, you know, citations or and so forth. I, it's just that there's that incentive, again, to uh, take property if you know that you're going to benefit directly from it. Um, it's not to say that, you know, it shouldn't be uh, to deter crime. And I also believe that one should be convicted and then the property taken. But um, in, you know, overall, I, it, it seems like a conflict of interest that it goes directly. I understood, Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? I do have one question for Trisha Nakamatsu, if you're still here. Uh, yes, sir. So 
Thank you. I, so under the terms of this particular version of the bill, the, the um, law enforcement can still grab somebody's property if they believe that it was involved with a crime, correct? Yes. It, the difference is between the way it is now and this bill is that before they can actually take it and use it for something else, somebody has to be convicted of, of a felony. Is that right? Uh, that's that's one of the differences. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, members. Anything well, else? I I should. Well, oh, go it, ahead. That, okay. So the way the bill is written now is you would require a conviction before the property could be auctioned off, or before the it could be okay. kept forfeited. Okay. Um, but the the thing is that the the property once it's taken, it has to be stored somewhere. So that's going to take costs uh, and take expense and cost. It's going to take time. It could be years before that property or before a conviction is is had. Um, if you're talking about cars or electronics or uh, whatever else it could be, that is just not only is it going to have to be stored at someone's expense, but it's going to deteriorate and at which point it might have little or no value in the end anyway. Um, so that is but another still, but it would But it would still have the effect of uh, keeping it off the street. Interfering with the the criminal enterprise because the people that you thought were that your that your office would believe would be the ones who were uh, using it for their criminal enterprise wouldn't be able to get hold of it. True, it just might not leave the program to be self sustainable if there's nothing you know, left okay. to sell. And also, of course, convictions. Um, you're talking about of the cases is say if a um, someone had stated that a quarter of the forfeiture cases weren't even charged criminally. So the reason for that, of course, is that we're looking at a beyond a reasonable doubt standard, whereas um, civil looks at preponderance. So if those aren't charged, it's because it doesn't reach that other standard. But then you also have to go through all the trial process um, and, of course, all of the many, many factors that go into that to get a conviction. Um, and so everything, once you whittle everything down, very little is actually going to be able to be sold. And the condition of what is left over at the end um, when you get those condition, uh, convictions is it, it's going to cripple the system. If you want, the well, system unless it's unless it's ca unless it's cash, in which case you just put it in a bank and let it sit there. So I don't, sure, I don't know. What sure. Um, I don't know how much of that is necessarily. Yeah. Cash, so, um, OK, members, any other questions? Thank you. Members, any other questions? Senator Kale Kalole, go ahead. So, Ms. Nakamatsu, it seems like it seems like what you're saying, though, based off of what you're saying, if we do do this, it creates an incentive on the prosecutor's office to utilize their discretionary authority to move expeditiously in the prosecution of these cases, where these individuals, obviously, uh, in your estimation, have been utilizing these resources uh, to further criminal enterprises. Right. I mean, doesn't it create an incentive for you folks to move quickly and to be judicious in your determinations as to whether you're going to charge or not? Um, well, we already act as expeditiously as we can, um, given the facts and the investigation and, and the manpower, the workings of the system itself. Um, but well, I'm, sure you it, feel you, but it, I'm sure you feel you do, but it does seem like it does seem like as it relates to the the civil side of the forfeiture, it seems like you're alluding to, it, it seems like you're alluding to measures of justice or punishment that could potentially be um, uh, be initiated to these defendants where you don't actually have the, the criminal side tools to execute them. And so that's a little bit concerning. I, I, maybe I'm mishearing what you're saying, but it seems to me like if, if if this property is held, these individuals are are charged and convicted. Uh, you know, then justice is facilitated, right? The assets that have been used in the commission of these criminal enterprises or these criminal violations are no longer in their possession, and they weren't able to utilize them to skirt the, the criminal justice system. Except so, that mean, any reason? I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I'm sorry. But then I didn't we have to give it back if they're not charged or not convicted criminally. Well, you should give it back if they haven't been convicted of a crime. Um, so, two, two, 
points. Right? Um, I, uh, two things. Two things um, in response. Well, one, as everybody knows, it's not always the defendant who's. Uh, it's not always the defendant's property that's taken. For example, there's, and this is just a hypothetical, like the dad who perhaps knows his daughter deals drugs and lets her use the car, even though she has used it to deal drugs in the, in the past, things like well, that. Well, and then perhaps the legislature and in working with you folks should consider other statutory changes to make sure that we capture the crime well, or the, we the misdeed being conducted by those ancillary individuals that are not associated with the crimes charge. I, I suppose that I, is a policy. I, I'm, I'm okay there. Really Thank you, Chair. Want to charge those people. Um, I mean, I guess if the legislature wants us to, that would be a, a policy call. The other thing is that um, the property. I, I agree with you. I think it's a policy call. So thank you. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Nakamatsu. Uh, any other questions from members? Okay, if not, let's go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is um, uh, SB 309, this adds the intentional disclosure or threat of disclosure of certain types of deep fake images or video to the offense of violation of privacy in the first degree. Uh, first up for SB 309 is Chris Van Martyr for the prosecuting attorney. Good morning, Chair Rhodes. Chris Van Martyr, Deputy Prosecutor. Um, so as the Chair knows, um, SB 309 was part of a uh, a larger bill that was introduced last year uh, that was part of our 21st Century Privacy Law Task Force, which Senator Lee was a part of and chaired. So I know he's familiar with the background of this uh, part of the task force's efforts. Um, so SB 309 uh, passed out of the task force without any opposition. It was heard by the legislature. Um, it passed out of the House with zero opposition. Uh, it was heard by the Senate, uh, the Consumer uh, Protection Committee. Um, they had no objection to this part of that bill. And this bill, unfortunately, stalled when it reached the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I believe that was primarily based on testimony, written testimony from the Motion Picture Association of America. And they have um, resubmitted their written testimony. It's basically the same as last year. And I wanna address a couple of points in their written testimony because the points that they're attempting to make are not, not valid reasons for not moving forward this, with this bill. So the third paragraph of their letter, they point out that the Supreme Court has recognized certain categories of speech that fall outside of the First Amendment's protection. But what they don't mention when they cite this case, United States versus Alvarez, is that the United States Supreme Court itself has said in that very case that they quoted that this is the type of legally cognizable harm associated with the false statement that falls outside the First Amendment and the example they give, and I'll just quote the exact words, an invasion of privacy. Okay, so the case they cite in their written testimony itself points out that false statements made in connection with an invasion of privacy that is meant to harm substantially a victim falls okay. outside the scope of the First thank, Amendment. Thank, thank you very much. Members may have questions for you, but that's the end of the two minutes. Uh, next up, we have Melissa Paddock, uh, uh, Motion Picture Association. Hi, Senator Rhodes. Uh, Melissa Patak is not in the Zoom room at this time. Oh, okay. Uh, they are in opposition. Uh, next is Chris Cofield, uh, Emu Alliance and Support, Mauricia Palma Elmori, Executive Director, SAG AFRA, uh, the Hawaii Local and Support, uh, Halem Carrera, also with SAG AFRA, AFRA, sorry, in Support, Venus Arthur, testifying for ILWU Local 142, in Support, Faith Bay, in Support, Leanne Tevis, in Support, Kelly Rice in support, Scott Rogers in support, Gene Simon in support, Deborah Glazier also for SAG AFTRA in support, Makana Paris for the Iron Workers Stabilization Fund in support, Joseph O'Donnell also for the, oh, I'm sorry, for the Iron Workers Local 625 in support. Uh, Trisha Nakamatsu, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney in support, Lindsay Vierhelig for the Wait a minute, it's just the right. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 
Let me be sure I have the right bill here. Just a second. Not me. No, that's it. Uh, Joseph O'Donnell with the local, uh, Iron Workers Local 625 was the last one on this bill. I apologize. Uh, members, any questions? Chair, um, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Fidel, go ahead. Not so much a, um, a, a question. Um, just the previous speaker said, um, you know, to have this bill um, move forward um, with all the support it had <clears throat> previously, I just have it stalled because a few individuals want to continue to not only. Um, continue to do what they're doing. But most of all, it's about making, I guess, having the part of making money. Um, I've seen this numerous of times over the years, and it's, it's to me a big shame, and, and, it, and it should be um, regulated, and it should have, this thing, you know, this thing should go forward here, because um, I don't know about you, but I had a few of my faces. <laughs> on certain videos and um, cartoons that never got my permission, but it's only on a small scale here in Hawaii. But we're talking about internationally. Um, I, I think that's as, as, a, as a local boy, it's okay because we can kind of shrug it off. But as we go internationally, I think it's a shame that this continues to go uh, forward. So I, I just, I agree with the uh, uh, previous speaker about that we shouldn't be um, hindered by one uh, corporation or one entity in trying to stop this bill from going through. So that's just that's just my comment, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Favela. Um, any other questions, members? I do have one for uh, Mr. Van Marder. So the, the revenge porn prohibition uh, that we passed several years ago now uh, includes a requirement that the disclosure was done without the consent of the depicted person. That We don't have that in this draft of this bill. Do you think that's a necessary addition? No, I don't, Chair. And the reason why is because the very essence of what's going on here is the perpetrator is taking the known image of the victim, for example, the portrait headshot, and they're using software to copy and paste that onto another person. It's typically uh, depicted in pornographic settings. So I think um, there's really no likelihood that a victim would consent to having their face put onto another person's body and then put on the internet in the form of a picture or video. And there's software out there that's just come out in the last couple of months that literally can do this in two or three seconds. It takes um, just a couple clicks of the mouse. It's called Luminar AI, it costs $80. Uh, you can literally do a face swap for a video or a picture for as little as $80 software. So I just don't think that um, the victims, which are typically ex-girlfriend, ex-wife, are gonna consent to have their head swapped onto um, a pornographic star and then have that uh, put on the internet. So I, I don't see that as um, an element that we would have to prove. I suppose that if uh, if someone actually if if the defense came, brought the uh, the alleged victim in and said yes, I did consent to that and I wanted that to happen, that would probably do some damage to your case anyway. So, and correct, and the the law already has some exceptions. Uh, it's in subsection two A and B. Those are exceptions that take this out of the revenge porn statute. So, you know, those are where they're in public or they're voluntarily engaging in a sex act or some sort of sexual conduct. So I think the exceptions already address that scenario. Be sure I've got everything I need in there. Okay, so I guess the other question would be that, so the proposed expansion of the privacy law includes uh, deep, uh, for the deep fakes requires both that the perpetrator have action, acted intentionally and with the intent to substantially harm. Uh, are both elements needed or is that too high a bar? 
Um, well, that's a good question, Senator. So if you look at subsection B, which is already there, it does include the same intent language as to the result of conduct. And it's that element that brings this within the Constitution. So I would submit that it's critical that we do include the intent provision because that's what's gonna bring it within the Constitution because no one has a First Amendment right to engage in this sort of uh, conduct with the intent to harm the victim in the way that the statute is proposing. So if we were to not have the intent as to conduct and intent as to result, I think it would be problematic constitutionally. Okay. And so, so that's why when we did the revenge porn statute, we created it that same way. So you, you would prefer both? Correct. Okay. Okay, that's it for me. Members, any other questions? Yeah, Chair, just, just one more. Senator uh, Favella, go ahead. Um, the reason why I'm seeing it, and what uh, uh, they were saying earlier, is that the problem is not only the software is cheap, I mean, they're advertising all over Facebook. You can make animals, whatever, but the intention was these programs was to be cute. But people are using it for child pornography. So I'm going to put a child's face on a, on a, on a, on a naked lady. Those kinds of stuff is, is being problematic and very disturbing. And this is the reason why, like you said, um, I, 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 I think we need both of them. I, I totally agree. So that's the only disturbing part that I, I've been getting a lot of emails on this and, um, you know, thank you guys for taking up this measure, but I, I think it's something very serious to look into because of, you know, we got to protect not only our family, but we got to protect our kids. They cannot be having their face on naked bodies all over the place. Um, that's not, that's not Pono. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it uh, looks like um, one of the people who wanted to testify in person, Melissa Paddock, is now here for the Motion Picture Association. Ms. Paddock, if you'd like to testify, we it's as you're aware, it's a two minute limit. Go ahead. Morning. So first of all, uh, my apologies. Uh, my time was off and, and I sincerely apology, apologize for not being there on time. Uh, I have submitted written testimony, so I won't take your time to go through that written testimony. We do believe there are serious constitutional challenges with this bill, but they can be fixed. We have some amendments that we would like to suggest to you uh, to make sure that there are, this doesn't capture um, unintended behavior. Uh, we have um, uh, unintended uh, um, images and, and photographs. Examples of things that could be implicated by this bill are things that we all watch and enjoy, parodies and satires, things on The Daily Show, um, uh, the John Oliver Show, all of the political satire shows that we enjoy could be implicated for the kinds of um, work that they do. So we have some suggested amendments to um, to address the over broadness of this bill and the and the constitutional challenges that it would create. Um, and I would like to be able to share those with you. Our, our advocate in, um, in Honolulu has those, Bruce uh, Copa, and we're happy to continue discussions with you. But we do believe there are serious infirmities in this bill, um, and we look forward to continuing to work with the committee to address the, the, the problems and the issues. And I'm happy to answer any specific uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much. Members, any questions? All right, thank you very much for, for joining us and uh, that, that's it for that one. We'll go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is uh, SB 343 uh, relating to sexual assault on an animal establishes the crime of bestiality, provides that the bestiality is that subjects a minor to sexual contact with an animal or is committed in the presence of a, of a minor. Uh, first up on 343, SB 343 is uh, Trisha Nakamatsu, uh, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney. Uh, thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu on behalf of the Home Prosecuting Attorney's Department. Uh, we do support the bill. Um, we you know, note that our written testimony includes several recommendations where we feel that uh, perhaps a little bit more analysis could be done in comparing the proposed offense or adjusting the language of the proposed offense and its parameters uh, in light of existing terminology, um, other places where the word bestiality 
for deviant sexual intercourse perhaps are already used in the HRS, uh, as well as a couple of places where there might be some overlap or places that are already covering some of these uh, types of offenses, such as the promoting child abuse in the first, second, and third degree, um, and potentially prostitution. But we're happy to, I'm sorry, we didn't have a, a time to bring proposed uh, amendments, but we'd be happy to work with the committee or any other stakeholders if, if needed. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, next up we have Lindsay Verhelig, State Director for Humane Society of the United States. Oh, I'm sorry, she's not here. Uh, just in support, uh, Michelle Velasco in support, Stephanie Kendrick, Public Policy Advocate, Hawaiian Humane Society, I believe she is here. Yep, there you are, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Okay, Stephanie Kendrick, Public Policy Advocate for the Hawaiian Humane Society. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and members for hearing this bill. Um, it's good to see your faces, even from remotely. Uh, we, you do have our testimony and support. I wanted to spend my time with you this morning talking about the urgency of passing this bill. Um, I spend as little time as possible on social media, but I have brave friends who flag things for me, and I understand that Reddit has blown up with some criticism of the legislature for taking this measure up when you have more important things on your mind, such as our economic crisis. Um, I, I do not want to at all minimi minimize our economic crisis, but I would point out that this bill does not require any state funding. Uh, and I don't think that we can use the economic crisis to slow down progress on protecting our community, the animals and people in our community. So I applaud the legislators for taking this up. I encourage you to continue it moving along. Um, you know, this passing this bill is probably gonna show us things that we don't wanna know about our community and what they've found in states across the country as these laws have passed over the last 20 years uh, is that arrests for bestiality related offenses have gone up 800%. Louisiana, one of the most recent states to pass such a law in 2018, in the first six weeks of this year, they've had an arrest on 34 counts of pornography involving juveniles and eight counts of pornography involving animals. That suspect is being held on $13 million bail. Another suspect was arrested in January in a shootout with local sheriffs attempting to take him into custody on 60, 36 counts of sexual assault of an animal. He's also facing seven counts of child pornography. Uh, those crimes tend to be linked in a lot of these cases. So this really is about protecting our animals and our people. And I urge the committee to pass this bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have uh, Anna New Neubauer for the Hawaii Association of Animal Welfare Agencies. I said, Here, right? Sorry, Matt. I was just going to say that I, I can speak for Howa if that's okay with you. Anna could not make the hearing. Uh, that's okay. Thank you. She in support. We'll, we'll go ahead and yeah. move on. Uh, Martha Randolph for the Environmental Caucus, the Democratic Party of Hawaii, in support. Inga Gibson for Pono Advocacy. I think she's here. Go ahead. Uh, Aloha, Chair Rhodes, members of the committee. Inga Gibson on behalf of Pono Advocacy. Uh, in strong support of this measure, uh, per my written testimony, I have unfortunately um, dealt uh, directly in the investigation of a number of uh, what are formerly known as bestiality cases. And um, it's, it's unfortunate, but this is something that does need to explicitly be prohibited within our existing animal cruelty statute. Um, obviously these cases are difficult uh, to investigate. Um, my colleague, Jenny Edwards, I just saw is actually on the call. Um, she and I worked one of the most, I hate to say, notorious horse uh, bestiality cases 15 years ago in Washington state. So I'll, I'll let her speak to more of the details, but um, it was one of those cases where it wasn't until there was a case that hit the media, uh, did the legislature act. That's what happened in Washington state. And we subsequently enacted a anti-animal sexual abuse bill in 2006. But um, I know this isn't something you read about all the time. Unfortunately, it does occur. And so we urge your support and um, I'll defer to Jenny Edwards for any of her further experience. And Buster says, thank you. Okay, He's thank available you. for adoption. 
for Angel. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kathy Gogol for Animal Rights Hawaii and support Marion Husenbuchs or Husenbu for Animal Interfaith Alliance in Britain in support. And we have a long list of individuals, uh, the first one of which is opposed, and then basically the whole page is in support. So I'm not going to go, I'm not going to read all of them. Um, the next person we have that is here to testify in person is Jenny Edwards for, yeah, for Jenny Edwards. I think I saw you here. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to be a part of this amazing bill that is finally, hopefully, going to get passed this time around. I know you guys have looked into this matter quite a bit. It's a difficult subject to tackle, uh, so I appreciate your sticking with it and, and being willing to, to work together to make this, make this a reality. Um, what I'd like to do, actually, I did submit written testimony. I think it got there just a little late, probably because I was amending it to the last minute. Um, so you do have my written testimony. And what I'd like to do is to take the time to, to take questions from you. Um, I know you may have some questions and hopefully I'll be, I'll be able to answer those for you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, questions come at the end. So let me finish up the okay. test our list. Uh, then after that, we've got one, two, three, four, five more individuals all in support. And that's all the testimony we have on SB 343. <laughs> Uh, members, any questions? Uh, well, I have a couple. If no one else does, or I'll get us started anyway. Um, so, Ms. Edwards, your testimony mentions uh, your expertise in this subject matter. Do you, do you anticipate an issue if the offense is termed sexual assault of an animal instead of bestiality? I don't think the terminology really matters, honestly, a whole lot. The reason why um, when I was helping with the edits on this bill from prior language that had been submitted, I, I looked at what I tend to do is I look at the existing statutes that you have for uh, child sexual assault and modify or mimic that language basically. Uh, so the one challenge that I have seen, well, let me back up. So bestiality is the term that is most frequently used by other states. About a third of all the states that have <coughs> bestiality statutes already use bestiality as the term. Um, the next most often used terminology is crimes against nature or carnal knowledge. And then it's a range of other things. So um, it's terminology that's most familiar to prosecutors. And I think because it, it, it very specifically relates, people immediately con uh, connect the word bestiality with animals and not with humans, uh, where sexual assault and sexual abuse, sometimes that, that becomes, that it's, it's uh, okay. assumed you, that's a person you think it necessarily about. matters in I, not really. I don't think it makes a lot of difference. What's important, it, what's really important is that you've started this out as a felony and not a misdemeanor, because okay. that means that you're taking it seriously. Pre previous bill, bills define sexual conduct in greater length and with more detail. Well, this bill's definition is shorter and potentially broader in application. Do you, do you have an opinion whether uh, the, the more detailed version is better or whether the, uh, the shorter and potentially broader is better? My, uh, both my opinion and, and my observation of, of cases that I've worked on is that the broader the language is, the better it is because it's more encompassing. These cases rarely go to appeal. They very rarely actually even come to trial. Typically what happens is the person will, <clears throat> excuse me, the offender will plead down <clears throat> to a lesser charge or to fewer of the fewer counts of the same charge. So, uh, what's most important is that, that, that it's a thing that's taken seriously. I'm actually not a fan of being super specific about the language, uh, mainly because that if you have a, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a good defense attorney, they are apt to say, well, this specific instance doesn't meet the exact definition that you've given. So typically I'm not a fan of that language. Okay. Um, it, but it, it, that is, again, is mimicked from um, your child sexual assault. Yeah. Okay. Members, any other questions? Senator Gabbard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Jenny, how many states have passed uh, laws like this in the country? Um, all but four. All but four and the District of Columbia. Okay. 
And, and both uh, Wyoming also has legislation that will be presented to committee, probably not until March, um, but that leaves two, two states left. I see. And are there studies of the correlation between bestiality and child sexual assault? Absolutely. Um, a study that I spent four years basically pulling the data um, was published in 2019. I think that's noted in the written testimony. There's a link to it in there. Um, and basically what I found was that 34% of all of the bestiality offenders also sexually abuse children. And a different 32, I think it was, 30 some percent also collected child pornography and either had sexual contact with or collected um, animal pornography as well. So it's de there's definitely a very significant correlation. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. I thank do have a so question. Much. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I do have a couple of questions for the prosecutor, I guess, uh, Ms. Nakamatsu. Ms. Nakamatsu, are you on this bill? Thank you. I can just barely hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. That's better. Oh, okay. Um, so the, the question that I asked uh, Ms. Edwards about the um, the specific the specificity of the the crime versus the more general one, what, what I mean, you're the ones you're the guys are going to have to deal with these. Is which one do you prefer? Uh, well, as Ms. Edwards was saying, if you wanted to fashion it after the sex assault statutes, then sex assault in the third degree is for children knowingly subjecting a child uh, less than fourteen years old to sexual contact. Um, so there's, I could see, we could see the, the reasoning behind that. That's a C felony. Um, so that would, that would argue in favor of the more specific list? More general in? sexual contact as opposed to oh, sexual you, you, conduct. You, okay. Um, the see. thing that, the thing that if you wanted to um, differentiate between the different grades of offense, um, that would make sense too. Having uh, sexual conduct versus sexual contact. Conduct such as penetration, you might want to judge different or penalize um, or view differently than mere contact. Whereas currently this statute would basically lump all of that together. Okay, so I, but so bottom line is you prefer the broader definition that's in the bill now as opposed to the, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm unclear as to which side of that you um, can't I think it's just a different approach. Because if you wanted to lump everything together as a C felony, and if minors are involved, B felony, whether it's contact or penetration um, conduct, um, then then this would do that. Okay. But if you want to um, parse out different grades of the offense, then then you would get into more specific things like separating contact from penetration from okay. perhaps okay. other types of conduct. I think. Um... So then paragraph A and G of the bill prohibit similar activities, subjecting an animal to sexual contact and subjecting an animal to sexual contact in the presence of a minor, respectively. Mm -hmm. the, doesn't the general prohibition against subject, subjecting an animal to sexual conduct apply to situations where it is done in the presence of a minor? Yes. And that was something we no noticed as well, is that there is, there's a lot of overlap in the different um, subsections of the bill. That's not necessarily a bad thing because we can charge under multiple subsections. Um, it, it, I don't think that would necessarily be a problem. Okay. All right. Uh, I think that's all the questions I have. Just a second. Let me double check. Yeah. It members, anybody, that's it for me. Anything else from anybody else? S Senator Kim? No. Okay. All right, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and move on to the next bill. If I can turn the page in my sheets here. Okay, next up is SB 399. This provides that certain rights shall be deemed waived if a preliminary determination of probable cause is rendered during a chapter 92 meeting in the, I'm sorry, this has to do with the campaign spending commission. The person fails to request a continue tested case hearing within 20 days. Allows the Campaign Spending Commission to have an order confirmed as a judgment by the First Circuit, giving an order the same force and effect of any other judgment issued by the Circuit Court. And there would be no appeal because it would simply be a judgment. Uh, first up on 399 is 
Gary Cam for the Campaign Spin Commission. Morning again. Can't hear you. There you go. Uh, good morning again. Uh, I just want to briefly note that under 11-405, uh, a respondent has 20 days to request a contested case hearing. And if they don't, then the, the preliminary order of the um, commission becomes final and an appeal can be taken on the final order. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Sandy Maud, Executive Director of Common Cause. If she's still, oh, there you are, I'm sorry, go ahead. Morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Common Cause Hawaii stands on its written testimony in support of 399. We're just concerned that any um, order confirmed in the circuit court is not appealable. Um, due process is uh, central to our democracy. And uh, that's it. It's basically okay. set forth in our written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Beppe Shapiro, Legislative Committee, League of Women Voters in Support, and Fina Bonoan in opposition. That's all the written testimony we have. Members, questions? Uh, I think I have a couple. Hang on just a second. Uh, for Mr. Cam, so I just want to be sure I'm understanding what the bill does. So if at the beginning of the process, uh, the, you, you, the, the, the commission says, we think we have probable cause that you have uh, committed X uh, uh, violation of the campaign spending rules. And at that point, you, the, the respondent can challenge the, the probable cause determination. Is that correct? Yes, by requesting a contested case hearing within 20 days of receipt of that preliminary order. Okay, so then if they, so this bill doesn't have anything to do with that, right? It, this is after that. If they don't contest it, Yes. So if they don't so, contest it, if so they, they, if, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. So if they don't contest it within 20 days, then under our law currently, the preliminary order of the commission becomes a final order. And uh, that is uh, normally what you uh, would appeal from. But the bill says that you, uh, the fact that the violation is not appealable because at that point, what you have going up on appeal, you don't have a record on appeal because you you didn't ask for a contested case hearing. There was no contested case hearing. So uh, the court uh, can only enforce that on this. <laughs> unless you raise collateral matters under rule 60 to get the court to set aside that order. Okay, so 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 the the process that's due is the fact that you have a right to contest the probable cause, uh, the probable cause determination. Okay, and then after that, you're just saying we want it to be a final order that in a judgment, you, you, a judgment's a judgment. It's all over at that point, correct? Right, right. So, so this bill is mainly to uh, uh, assist the commission uh, in in collecting on these order, enforcing the order and collecting on the fines. Um, uh, of course, if there are any reasons why you, you have to set aside that order, then you can do that under Rule 60 of the civil, Rules of Civil Procedure. Okay. okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? Okay, if not, let's go ahead and move on to SB 400. This is also a campaign spending uh, matter. Clarifies that increased fines may apply if a candidate committee or non-candidate candidate committee fails to timely file the preliminary primary or preliminary general report due 10 days before the primary or general election. First up on SB 400 is uh, Gary Cam, Campaign Spending Commission. Uh, yeah, good morning again. Uh, the commission stands on its uh, written testimony and support. Okay, thank you. Next is Sandy Ma, uh, Common Cause Hawaii, Executive Director. 
Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight individual testifiers. Seven are in support and one is in opposition. Uh, and uh, members, any questions? Okay, let's see. Uh, so for Mr. Cam, so the reason you're, the reason the bill only specifies these, the, the preliminary primary and preliminary general reports, is that because the other reports already have fines associated with them? Yeah, so under uh, uh, prior, the, the reason why this bill became necessary was uh, I think in 2019, the legislature added an additional preliminary primary report and added an additional preliminary general report. Uh, so the statute has always has always had a different fine for the um, second preliminary primary. Uh, uh, it was a $300 minimum fine and the other fines would be, would be $200 minimum fine. But by creating that third report, the second preliminary now is the middle report instead of the one that's 10 days before. I mean, if you, if logically, if you count them, right, one, two, and three, yeah. first one, the earliest one. Okay. So we just wanted to make it clear that the higher fine applies to the uh, report that is due 10 days before okay. before the election. Right. Just want to be sure that, that, that I thought that's what's correct, but just want to double check. Members, any other questions? Uh, Senator Keo Kaloli. Mr. Kim, is that a maximum $300 fine or a minimum $300 fine? Uh, that is a minimum fine. You have to file, right? That's... That... Sorry. I, Sorry I, guess me, I might be... Well... Because in your testimony, you're referring to 11340C in which you state that the increased fine not to exceed $300 per day. You have general fine authority to set at the commission's discretion. And so I'm trying to just make sure I understand whether we're referring to a minimum $300 per day fine or a maximum $300 per day fine. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, that is, that is a minimum fine uh, but the fine cannot exceed 25% of the total amount of contributions or expenditures. Okay, so I think you gotta, I, th I think you need to amend your testimony then. Otherwise I'm confused. I, I might be. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on to SB 401, also a campaign spending bill, increases the amount of the fine for campaign spending law violations that may be assessed against a non-candidate committee, making only independent expenditures and that has received at least one contribution of more than $10,000 or spent more than $10,000 in an election period, allows the campaign spending commission to order that the payment of a fine assessed against a non-candidate committee or any portion thereof be paid from the personal funds of an officer of the non-candidate committee. Uh, first up on 401 is uh, Gary Cam, campaign spending. The uh, commission stands on its testimony and support. Thank you. Next is Sandy Ma, Executive Director of Common Cause. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. We stand on our written testimony and support to raise the fines for PACs and super PACs to be comparable to individuals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Dyson Chi in support, Tlaloc Takuda in support, Martha Nakajima in support, Michael Galoyo Jr. in support, Fina Bonoan in opposition, Lori Boyle in support, Carolyn Kunitake in support. That's all the testimony we have on SB 401. Members, any questions? I don't have any either. Let's go ahead and move on to the last bill on the agenda, SB 403, 
Uh, this is also relating to campaign spending, uh, provides that candidates do not need to file a preliminary general report if they are either unsuccessful or are elected to office in the primary election. Um, first up is Gary Cam for Campaign Spending Commission. Chair, the commission stands on its written testimony in support. Okay, thank you. The only other one, I, other testifier we have is Fina Bonoan, and she's, or I guess it's a she, I don't know. That person is in support. Members, any questions on 403, SB 403? Uh, okay, I don't have any questions either. All right, uh, members, uh, I've suggested that we just go ahead and do uh, decision making without going into a, um, a uh, breakout room. If that's okay with everyone, I'll just go ahead and give my recommendations and we'll go. But if people object, we can go to the, uh, we can go to the uh, breakout room. Any, any concerns of doing it that way? Okay. I will go ahead and uh, go through the list. Okay, so uh, uh, Vice Chair, what we'll do is if you could go ahead and take the votes per normal, but we will, um, staff is writing down on the vote sheets. Looks like you're at home, I can't really tell, um, but we'll figure out either I'll go in and sign them or if you're in, you can sign them, but we'll worry about that. But, uh, but I will call on you to take the votes. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning, which is SB 200. This clarifies that the candidate or other committee representatives as specified who make contributions over a certain amount prior to an election are required to file a late contribution report only if the candidate is on the ballot of that election. So if you've won in the, if you've won in the primary, you don't have to file a late report at the general because you because you're not on the ballot. Uh, recommendation on this one is to pass unamended. Any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on Senate Bill 200, the Chair's recommendation is to move this measure. I uh, to pass unamended. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Acasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Uh, chair recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Next up is SB 294. This is the, uh, this restricts civil asset forfeiture to cases involving the commission of a felony where the property owner has been convicted of an underlying felony offense and directs any forfeiture proceeds to the general fund. Uh, the recommendation here is to, um, pass out some with some amendments. Uh, reflecting the AG's testimony, we'll remove the language in the preamble about the negative auditor's report and that they have um, cleaned up most of the questions that the auditor was concerned about. And we'll also add language to say nothing in this bill, to the, some words to the effect that nothing in this bill prohibits forfeitures authorized in other chapters. There are other uh, forfeiture procedures that are used in, in other contexts. And I think there's text as well. Any questions or concerns? Seeing none, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 294, passing with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Acasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you very much, members. Moving on to SB 309, it's relating to privacy. This adds the intentional disclosure or threat of disclosure of certain types of deep fake images to the offense of violation of privacy in the first degree. Uh, recommendation here. Uh, the recommendation here is to pass with just text, text only. Any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Uh, so that's unamended, right? No, with technical amendments. Okay, so members voting on SB 309, 
chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. Uh, chair Rhodes. Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Acasio. Aye, with reservations. Senator Acasio with reservations. Senator Gabbard. Aye. Senator Kim. Aye. Senator Lee. Aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much. Next up is SB 343. This establishes the crime of bestiality, provides that the bestiality is a class C felony or class B felony if the offense if the offense subjects a minor to sexual contact with an animal, animal or is committed in the presence of a minor. A recommendation is to go ahead and move this out. Um, hang on a second, let me find my... So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, recommend that we delete subsection G regarding the unlawful activity being conducted in the presence of a minor as it would seem to be duplicative of other provisions in the bill. And we'll go ahead and use the term uh, sexual assault of an animal instead of bestiality. There's, there's other statutes where bestiality is used and we'd like to not get tangled up with them. And I believe there'll be text as well. Questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 343, the recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Acasio. Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you, members. Next up is SB 399, I think. Yep, it is. Uh, this is a campaign spending bill. Provides that certain rights shall be deemed waived if a preliminary determination of probable cause is rendered, and the person doesn't fails to request a contested case hearing within the 20 days. Allows the campaign spending com commission to have an order confirmed as a judgment by the first circuit, giving the order the same force and effect of any other judgment issued by the circuit court, which generally means there's no appeal. In this case, it will mean there's no appeal. Uh, recommendation here is to go ahead and pass it with technical amendments only. Any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on Senate Bill 399, passing with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye, Senator Acasio. Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. I, I went out of order again. Senator Kim. Okay, aye. Senator Favela. Aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is SB 400. Clarifies that increased fines may apply if a candidate committee or non-candidate committee fails to timely file the preliminary primary or preliminary general report 10 days before the primary or general election. Uh, recommendation is to uh, pass with technical amendments only. Questions, concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 400, the recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Acasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Recommendation adopted. Thank you very much. Next up is SB 401, another campaign spending bill. Uh, increases the amount of the fine for campaign spending law violations that may be assessed against the non-candidate committee making only independent expenditures and that has received at least one contribution of more than $10,000 or spent more than $10,000 in an election period. Allows the CSC to order that the payment of a fine assessed against the non-candidate committee or any portion thereof be paid from the personal funds of an officer of the non-candidate committee. Uh, recommendation here is to pass unamended. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Keokololi. Members voting on SB 401. The recommendation is to pass as is. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Acasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is the last bill, SB 403. 
uh, provides that candidates do not need to file preliminary general reports if they are either unsuccessful or are elected to office in the primary election. Um, yeah, I think that's what it does. Um, and again, the recommendation here is to pass without amendment. Without amendment. Any questions or concerns? If not, Vice Chair. Members voting on SB 403, the chair's recommendation is to pass this measure as is. Chair Rhodes? Aye. Vice Chair goes aye. Senator Acasio? Aye. Senator Gabbard? Aye. Senator Kim? Aye. Senator Lee? Aye. Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. All right, thank you everyone for being here this morning. Uh, our next hearing is on Thursday morning. I forget what time, it's nine, 15 or something like that. Anyway, Thursday morning. Thank you very much. Have a good day.